brought psychedelic guitar to Motown as a member of the Funk Brothers, hit big with his own projects in the early 70s, was the first white artist to perform on Soul Train, and found and produced the artist known for the song Sugar Man. Our guest today is Dennis Coffey on the VVN Music Podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 25 of the VVN Music Podcast. I'm Roger Wink, and our guest today is guitarist, producer, and arranger Dennis Coffey. While Dennis is best known for his early 70s instrumental hits Scorpio and Taurus, his influence and innovations in the music world powered many other artists. Starting as a studio guitarist in the burgeoning Detroit music scene, he played on such songs as The Reflections Just Like Romeo and Juliet. Toward the end of the 60s, he was brought into Motown's Funk Brothers, where his guitar moved the label towards a new sound with funky, psychedelic arrangements. Starting with The Temptations' Cloud Nine, his guitar could be heard on a long list of records that not only changed the label's direction, but brought a new social consciousness to the Motown sound with records like Ball of Confusion by The Temptations and War by Edwin Starr. Moving into production in the early 70s, Dennis worked with Gallery on their hit Nice to Be With You and found the artist Rodriguez, who recorded two albums and then disappeared from the music scene until his career was revived with the recent award-winning documentary Looking for Sugar Man. Dennis has just released a live album, Hot Coffee and D, Burning at Maury Baker's Showplace Lounge, from a recently discovered tape of a 1968 performance with the Lyman Woodward Trio that mixes jazz, rock, and funk on their interpretation of popular songs of the day, including By the Time I Get to Phoenix, The Look of Love, and Maiden Voyage. We talked to Dennis from his home in Detroit. Thanks for uh, talking with us about the new album and everything. Oh, I appreciate uh, the call. I always like talking about uh, albums and to the fans and everything. <laughs> I always, uh, I'm always willing to do that. Now, you still live in Detroit, right? I do. You've been there all your life? Uh, no. Uh, actually, I live about two miles outside of Detroit now, but uh, uh, I was in uh, in Detroit, and then I went in the Army. I was in the 101st Airborne Division uh, about the time that Hendrix was in there, and the, and the story you know, uh, that was running around down there as the guys in his unit took his guitar and hit it on him, and he was kind of upset about it, but uh, I had a, a guy that was my wingman playing rhythm guitar and singing uh, he got into a bar fight in Colorado and cut a guy up with a beer bottle, so he was given the choice go to prison or go airborne. So uh, uh, he was one of those guys where I don't think anybody would uh, try and take our guitars and hide them. He probably would have relished it because he went, went after them, so <laughs> it was kind of funny. <laughs> Well, your new album was originally recorded in 1968 while you were playing with the Lyman Woodward Trio. And yes. That was a bit of a, a side project, I assume, because you were working in the studio every day. Um, I assume you were doing it for pleasure. Uh, well, you know, also, you know, Mike Theodore and I, uh, Theodore and I were partners. You know, we were pr- production partners, and I was playing with uh, with that band, and it was down the street from Terry Sherma Studios, you know, so... You know, we just got this idea because Mike used to come and hear me play a lot. And said, Let's just see if we can't uh, get this as a project. You know, so Mike and I made that decision to, and we actually back in the day tried to get a deal for it, and we couldn't get anybody interested. Now, it was you and Mike that brought the other two members into the group. No, no, uh, Mike and I, uh, Mike Theodore and I, you know, we're, we're we're producing together, and I ended up playing with the Lime and Water Trio. And uh, so we were playing down the street from the studio. Mike used to come down there. And so uh, we just decided, well, let's see if we can record this group because the people really liked what we were doing. And uh, we hired Brian Dabrowski, the engineer, to come and record it. So that, that's kind of how that got started. Your bandmates were also well-known in the Detroit music scene. Uh, I think uh, Lyman was working with Martha Reeves, was it? Or Yeah. Yeah, he he was working around a lot uh, after that. I think that happened after we kind of split up. We had more time to do different things, and uh, so that that's what he was doing. And, uh, and Melvin Davis is out singing, doing gigs and stuff right now. You know, uh, Lyman's no longer with us, but I just sat in with Melvin about four months ago. He's still around doing stuff, but he's more towards the uh, vocals, and he puts on a nice show. 
Well, the album has a number of covers of well-known songs from that particular day, but in jazz infused with some rock and soul arrangements. You did the arrangements for the album, but it sounds like the, really the majority of it was improv. Yeah, yeah. You know what we usually did is, uh, uh, I'm, you know, because I'm a, I was a studio guy, so maybe I have a short attention span, but I always want to do new stuff. <clears throat> so basically, when I was playing at the Frolic, even I'd learn songs, and I would uh, give a chord sheet to uh, Lyman, and uh, we'd count it off and go. You know that we never rehearsed, and uh, so on any given day, you'd hear us playing. But if you heard us playing the same song a month later, it might come out different. That's kind of how we did it. Where did almost 50-year-old recording come from? Was it something that uh, someone had in storage and just surfaced, or were you aware of it right along? Uh, I had it in my basement, you know, and then uh, Kevin Goins is a friend of mine, and uh, I don't know, we started talking about something, and then uh, uh, Mike Theodore, when he lived in New York, uh, made a CD of six of the songs, and he was trying to shop it around, and that was back quite a while ago, and uh, nothing really happened there. So anyway, so suddenly uh, Kevin introduced me to, to Zev over at uh, uh, Residence Records, and I had those seven tapes sitting here, and they heard that CD, <clears throat> and they got interested in it. So what I did is uh, uh, I went to Pack 3 Studios here. Uh, uh, Richard Becker used to own the studio, and uh, his son Bob Becker now owns it because Richard had passed away. So uh, I took those uh, seven uh, tapes, the big reels of the four tracks, multi-tracks, and uh, and I had also uh, some uh, two-track uh, mix downs. I took those all over Mike Theodore and I to Bob Becker, and he baked the tapes so the coating wouldn't fall off, and he transferred it all to High Tech Digital. And it was so uh, funny because those seven tapes fit on a thumb drive. <laughs> <laughs> and so I sent those to the label out in California, and they uh, they liked it, and they signed a deal, and they uh, they went in the recording studio and, and you know put it together. There's enough in there for probably another CD as well, and they put it all together. And then uh, Bernie Grudman, of course, who did all of Michael Jackson's mastering, he mastered it, and uh, I really liked what they did with the material. It was really great. This was a regular gig that you were, were playing. Was it just that you happened to record on that night or on a couple nights, or were you regularly recording your shows? No, we weren't regularly. That was a special event that we hired the engineer to come in and do. That might have been just one night's worth of recording. And what condition were the recordings in? I mean, after 50 years, I know you said that they did some work on the tapes to uh, make sure everything stayed. Was there a lot of other restoration or, or uh, uh, work that had to be done on them? You know what? All I know is once they were converted to high-tech digital, uh, they had the stuff there. They might have used some of the mix downs as well. Uh, once they left our hands, I wasn't in the studio in L.A. with them, so once we digitized them and sent them out there, uh, I'm not sure what they did or had to do with them. Well, it really is. Uh, it's an interesting album in that you're known for all of these Motown songs and Scorpio and so forth, and uh, it gives a little bit different feel to your talents because of the more jazz influence of it. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm still playing every Tuesday night here in Detroit when I'm in town, and I've been at this place called Northern Lights Lounge in Midtown Detroit. This is my eighth year. And it's basically, you know, uh, sometimes I hire some singers to play with me, sometimes I don't. And uh, it's the same kind of organic approach. I mean, we, we just play the songs, and however they come out on any given night, is what you, what you see is what you get, and the people seem to respond because we're, we're packing them in. So that's, we're still operating on the same premise. Actually, i got some young players here in town, and Detroit's always been so great from an audience standpoint and so great from a musical talent standpoint. Do you ever have any thoughts of uh, laying some of those shows down on tape for a release? Uh, you know what? Right now I'm, I'm waiting because the label's got another CD worth of stuff. So uh, I think at some point in time, if they uh, say, you know what, why don't you uh, do something like that again, then uh, I'll get a hold of Theodore and maybe we'll uh, come up with a thing and do that. You know, we, Certainly they've got a, a sound man and a board there, so probably... Uh, we could get that done. I'm just waiting on the label to see uh, if that's something they would like. It's my understanding that uh, you started playing guitar in your early teens, and then by the time you were in high school, you were already playing on recording sessions. 
how did you go about learning guitar so well, so quickly? And, and what other guitar players from that time were you looking up to? Okay, uh, what I did, uh, I did my first record date at 15. Uh, and then you can go on YouTube, somebody posted it up there. It's a song called I'm Gone by Vic Gallen. And you can hear me do two solos on that record. When I was 15, I got hired, and I hired uh, the other guys to do the record. And I had to make sure one of the guys I hired was old enough to drive because me and the drummer were not. So we did that. And then, uh, I, you know, the, the whole thing, uh, uh, my mom's side of the family were very musical. And, uh, you know, I had a cousin, uh, uh, Marilyn, that could play uh, Moonlight Sonata, Beethoven stuff at 14, and her mom could play any of this classical stuff. And I had an aunt who could play ragtime piano and sight read it at 96 with no mistakes. You know, so so there's that heritage. So, anyways, uh, I, I you know studied piano a little bit and uh, ukulele and a little bit guitar, but it wasn't really clicking for me. And then I went up, uh, we went up every summer to the Upper Peninsula in Michigan for a week or two, and my two cousins. Uh, uh, Jim and Marilyn Thompson were playing guitars and doing country and western. And they were actually doing it. You know, I said, "Wow, they're, they're really playing." So they taught me some chords, and uh, I was inspired by the fact, well, if they could do it, I need to be able to do it. And uh, started off with country and western, and I was a big fan of Hank Williams and all that. And uh, so I just started that way, and uh, I took some lessons along the way for a while. And uh, you know, but mainly. Uh, on summer break up here, I used to practice eight hours a day, and and I, we we had to rock and roll was just being born back in the fifties. So uh, I remember when I heard Maybelline by Chuck Berry, and I took it to this guitar teacher, and he and I said, "What's this guy doing?" He says, "I have no idea." We had to learn that stuff off the records because it was being created. You no one could teach you how to play like that. So that's kind of how it started, and then uh, I was playing in the teen clubs uh, every Friday night at 16. You know, I'd audition for a gig and got a job with a band. I, you know, I was always, usually when I auditioned, I usually got the job. So I was doing, uh, like, weddings and stuff on Saturday night, and I was doing uh, teen clubs on Friday night. So I was working two nights a week uh, up until I was 18, and I kind of aged out of the thing. And uh, that's when I volunteered for the draft and volunteered for the airborne. After you got out of the service, uh, did you find it hard to break back into the music scene in Detroit? No, you know, it was interesting. Uh, when I was in the service, I was recording for, with Maurice Williams, and I had a record out when I was 19 under the name of Clark Summit down in Columbia, South Carolina. I was with the Airborne for about a year, and then I, they sent me down there. So uh, I was doing that sort of stuff, and so I got out of the Army, and uh there I was unemployed, you know, two years, and uh, two years of service, you know. And then when I got out of the Army, uh, two weeks went by, and a friend of mine called me, and he says, you know, he says, uh, we got a, need a guitar player for this band. We're working six nights a week. And me and my cousin, Doug Stewart, who used to play guitars together, auditioned for that job, and I ended up getting it. So I was only out of work two weeks when I left the Army, and then I was working six nights a week. And that led then to... To studio work, I know that you played on the reflections, just like Romeo and Juliet. And uh, what were some of the other sessions that you did through that time? Well, I was doing uh, <clears throat> before that. You know, I was with the Royal Tones, so we were uh, uh, signed to Harry Balk and uh, his labels. And uh, I played on Handyman with Del Shannon. We recorded that at Bell Sound in New York, and that was the first million seller I played on. So, uh, going from doing sessions when I was in the Army. Uh, down in Columbia, South Carolina, with different artists, and I ended up uh, doing a lot of uh, stuff. And Babbitt and I were doing uh, a lot of Northern Soul sessions, you know, like Open the Door to Your Heart by Daryl Banks and those kind of records and the volumes, all that stuff. And it just kind of <clears throat> just kind of moved on. And then, then one day after doing those sessions, I got a call from Golden World, you know, Ed Wingate's operation. And they said, well, we want to hire you to do a session. And I said, well, okay. When's the session? Right now, we're in the middle of it, and the guitar players can't read the charts. So I had I was I was babysitting my three year old, so I picked her up and took my gear and went down to the studio, and I stuck her in the corner and read the charts. And then I was doing sessions at Golden World all the time with uh, J.J. Barnes, you know, hum, real humdinger, and uh, Edwin Starr, S.O.S. and all that stuff. So th that's where it went, and that was moving that way. <clears throat> and then I got a call. Uh, one day down the road from uh, James Jamerson, because I had uh, met him at a session that they were sneaking out to do <laughs> late at night. 
and he introduced me to Hank Cosby at Motown, and he said, well, we're putting together, by then Motown had bought Golden World, and they said, uh, we're putting together this uh, producer's workshop upstairs at the studio, and uh, we're gonna, we want to hire you. It's going to be Jamerson's band. It'll be two and a half hours a night, four nights a week, so that the producers could come and experiment, you know, when it's not on the union clock and not on the studio time thing. So that started, and I was doing that, and then after two months, Norman Whitfield came in. He was a producer at Motown, and he had this chart on uh, this record, Cloud Nine, he wanted to do on the Thames. And Norman, you know, heard me playing in clubs, and he was, you know, he was looking for something because he was definitely a guy that, that was uh, going on the streets, hitting the bars and stuff. So he knew this whole thing starting, the psychedelic thing in protest songs. So I happened to have a wah-wah pedal, and I took it out and put it on the front of that song. And Norman heard that. He says, that's what I'm looking for. So two weeks, I was playing it with the Temptations. I have to ask, now, the studio at that time for Motown was still in the Hitsville, USA building? Yeah, but they also had Golden World now, which was a bigger studio, so they used that uh, for more for their horns and strings because it had a high ceiling. But the Hitsville itself, the rhythm tracks always were cut down there off the boulevard. It, it looks like such a small building to house such a giant operation with with recording studios and offices and everything. It's pretty well, amazing. They, were, they weren't in that building, actually. They had five five houses there. So all they had in that building is they might have had the, a tape library, but I'm not even sure of that. But they just had mainly the studio, and they probably had, I think, in the very initial stages upstairs, I think Barry lived upstairs. You mentioned that you were doing these sessions where the producers could experiment. Motown had a pretty set style and sound. How much resistance did did they get from, from Barry Gordy as far as taking the sound in a different direction and, and adding a much more uh, rock and psychedelic sound to it? Uh, you know what, Norman Whitfield was a, a, a pretty strong personality. You know, He was very creative. He had a vision. And uh, he had already had hits that he produced, and uh, he had uh, Barrett uh, Strong was helping him write the stuff, both of them. And I don't know politically what it took, but once Cloud Nine became a hit, it became much easier for Norman to follow his vision. And I was doing, you know, Ball of Confusion and all that stuff. So I was kind of the the guy that helped Norman get his vision. He, He pretty much moved the label around about, you know, quite a bit directionally instead of doing the love songs and the story songs he was doing war which i did and and, and the the songs that were talking about uh real life situations and all the stuff that a lot of groups were doing that whole psychedelic thing you know all all these groups were talking about the war and about the drugs and all that stuff so uh, i don't know how he got the stuff through the system but uh, i imagine after cloud nine was such a hit it probably made it a lot easier for norman well, I know the, I mean, the Temptation sound almost did a, uh, a 180 because all of a sudden they had things like, as you mentioned, Ball of Confusion, Runaway Child, Running Wild, and, and things like that. And, and the sound, the subject matter, everything just changed so much. Yeah, and and, every, and people don't realize, you know, with the Funk Brothers, there were about 11 of us in the studio. Uh, and the whole idea was we'd sit down and there'd be the arranger and the producer would be there. We'd sit down in front of this master rhythm chart that had all the parts on it, and our job was to read the chart. We used to call it a road map. Is to read the chart correctly, and then we could add a feel and maybe add some licks, and we'd be, you know, the the producer would and, and would be there then trying to <coughs> get uh, get us to do what they were trying to do with the material after. But we already you can't write the feel on the music like that. We had to create the feel. But we had to do one song an hour with no mistakes. If you made a mistake, they stopped the tape, and you had to do it over. So we did one song an hour, like six songs a day, two sessions, six hours, and made them hits. That's That was our job. What were some of the other innovations that you yourself brought? I mean, you mentioned the using the wah-wah sound and so forth, but you had some other innovations you brought to the label also, right? Yeah, I brought a fuzz tone, like a distortion pedal, and I brought the uh, Echoplex, which... Uh, if you hear it in the front of Ball of Confusion, you hear me using distortion and an echoplex. And that, that introduction I created on the fly. And just like the introduction to just my imagination, I created that on the fly. You know, it was just part of the, there was no overdubs. 
anything that I played solo wise or uh, intros or any of the psychedelic stuff I played on the Temptations records were right there in the session. You also played on uh, the Supremes. Was it someday we'll be together? Be together. Yes. I, yeah. And that vibrato part and then some backbeat stuff in that. How long did you stay with the Funk Brothers and, and with the Motown label? You know, uh, I played, I started about 67 and 68. I think Motown, I, I, for, uh, for a year I was in and out because I was touring with Scorpio. But then Motown moved to L.A., but I was I was already out in L.A. because Mike Theodore and I decided that uh, the, it was time for us to move on. You know, we were also signed as, uh, uh, I was signed as an artist and we we're house producers for Clarence Avon at Sussex, so we already had a job. So we moved out there, and uh, I was out in California in 73. That's when Motown uh, pretty much moved out there. And I was sitting around for a month or two after I told Motown out in L.A. I was there. And then all, and then I got a, a phone call one day. So uh, they they were on Santa Monica Boulevard. They had a double studio. They had offices on another place, too, and they had some offices in the studio. But they had a big studio for tracking downstairs, and they had a studio upstairs for overdubs. So on the first session I did at Motown, I went there at 10 a.m. in the morning, and I didn't get done till 4 a.m. the next day. It uh, it's my understanding that there was some constraints as far as people who played with Motown, like with the Funk Brothers, as far as doing outside sessions. Was that true? Uh, myself and Bob Babbitt weren't signed to that deal. In fact, it was funny because I was doing double sessions with Motown, you know, pretty much every day. And then I was doing their workshop at night. And then by 10 o'clock at night, I'm over at Holland Dozier and Holland doing Frida Payne and uh, Chairman of the Board and all their stuff. And so one day, Harry Balk, who was working for Motown, then, you know, I knew him from before, called me down to the office and he says, uh, you know, uh, they were having a big court case with Holland Dozier and Holland, Motown was. And they said, well, we don't want you working for those guys and blah, blah, blah. And I says, look, I'm a free agent. You're mixing me up with those guys you got under contract. I says, that's not me. Well, you know, uh, we use you on a lot of sessions, and we don't want you doing it. I says, hey, I'm doing what I want to do. Well, we won't call you. I says, don't call me, and I walked out. So they didn't call me for two weeks, and then I was back over there, and they never said another word about it. I, I assume that it's your, uh, for lack of a better word, twangy guitar on the uh, opening on Band of Gold by Freedom yep. Pain. Yeah, that's an electric sitar. What did you do with Chairman of the Board? Uh, you know, I did. I was there all the time, so give me a little more time and all those records. I did Free to Pain, I did the Honeycomb, I did all that stuff with Tom Dozier now. When you kind of implied that you were working with Mike Theodore fairly early on in this process, when did you two first start working together? You know, uh, it's funny because I was at Golden World doing sessions, and Mike Theodore was hanging around trying to gin up some work for himself. He had done uh, arrangements. Uh, rhythm section and horns so i'm doing my first string date uh i'll love you forever by the holidays you know i think joe hunter did the rhythm i think don davis hired me to do the strings so i was uh, majoring in music at wayne state so i hired some students there that were string players and uh, so i brought the string player the string parts out and so mike theater happened to look in the studio and here i am conducting a string session so he had a call from a guy, I think it was uh, Don Mancha or Steve Mancha, to do this song on uh, Jack Montgomery, Dearly Beloved, and he wanted a full orchestra. And Mike introduced himself to me, and he says, uh, I can do the horns and strings, but I, uh, the horns and rhythm, and but I've never done strings, and I noticed that you can do strings. I only did one string date. I says, yeah, I'm an expert. Of course I can do strings. <laughs> so we hooked up and did that whole session, that whole record you know, the horns and strings and everything. And so we became arranging partners. And that uh, ended up, uh, uh, we were doing a lot of charts and we were doing, you know, big arrangements. And then uh, uh, Ralph Tarana at uh, Tara Sherman Studios gave us an office there because we were doing sessions there. And then uh, Mike Theodore knew how to do sound engineering. And so we'd, we'd get together at 3 o'clock in the morning because we had keys to the studio, and all our friends that were playing club gigs that had talent, we'd bring them in and record them. And we got a few deals out of it. I think a few things came out of impact. But that's kind of how our partnership started. We became producers by doing it every night at 3 a.m. 
you uh, you put out your own first solo album. I think it was in 1969. And uh, you've recorded a, a number of them over the years. How did uh, how did Scorpio come around? Uh, you know, Scorpio, uh, Mike and I were doing all these big arrangements with string sections and horns, and I was in my basement, you know, trying to write some songs. And I said, well, I had this new sound-on-sound sound tape recorder. You know, unless Paul was the guy that invented that sound-on-sound sound approach where you could uh, overlay different uh, instruments on the same tracks and stuff. And I had a chance to work with Les Paul before he passed away, so that was... Uh, Interesting, you know, uh, doing that. Anyway, so I said, well, what if I write some songs, and instead of uh, using horns and strings, I have guitars do those parts. So I wrote ten songs, and I overdubbed in my basement on this recorder so I could play it for Mike and Theodore, and I had guitars playing those kind of parts. And he heard the songs and those, that approach. And he says, man, I like it. He said, I'll get Clarence Avon to back this thing, and that's kind of how that uh concept came together so you were producing you were already known as a great session player and now you had your own hit records and along comes the chance to produce the group gallery and all of a sudden you have this new hit with nice to be with you which is really quite a step away from the sound that you were used to making and working with how did that come about well you know it's interesting because mike theodore and i you know when we weren't in the studio we'd be out looking for talent so we were driving down 8 Mile, you know, <laughs> the same 8 Mile that was M&M 8 Mile, and we saw this small bar, and it was just the parking lot was just packed, and we said, well, what's going on here? What's the attraction? So we went in there, and Jim Gold was in there with another guy on guitar, and they were playing, just the two of them, and they were packing the place, and we started listening to what they were doing, and uh, uh, then uh, we ended up signing uh, Jim to a contract, and that was the gallery. That's where it came from. Uh, you and Mike also found and produced uh, one of the bigger stories of the last few uh, years in music, but back in 1970 with Rodriguez. Um, where did you find him? Well, you know what happened with Rodriguez is Harry Balk did two songs on him for Impact Records, and we were the arrangers. That's where we first met Rodriguez. And then Harry dumped him off the label. He didn't have a hit with him, and Harry found him too hard to work with, whatever his reasoning. He dropped him from the label. And then Rainey Moore was Rodriguez's manager, and she called us and said, Rodriguez is no longer with Harry Balk, and he's looking for a new deal, and he's playing at this place called the Seward downtown. So Mike and I drove down there, and this was, uh, you know, like the movie. You know, you go in there, and it's smoke-filled bar by the riverside with the freighters going up and down and and uh, we hear this guy singing and we look and Rodriguez is singing with his face to the wall I says, oh he was an it? early version of Sia yeah yeah I said so who does this who faces the wall and sings so we could see the back of his head and uh, but then we listened to what he was singing which was his songs that he had written and uh, and we heard it he said this guy's this guy's got it so uh, we convinced Clarence to sign Rodriguez and he was so shy, the first four songs of the album, we recorded him and his guitar, sent him home, and then I played bass, and we built a band around him for those four songs, and then after that, we could record him with a live band. It uh, it was just really interesting the way that he just kind of disappeared but stayed so popular down in South Africa, and then all of a sudden, everything came back with, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole story that's that's told in Looking for Sugar Man. Yeah, you know, you know, the whole idea uh, in that film, you know, Rodriguez used to be calling me all hours of the night when, when he never had a chance of getting anything because the record was done, he had no deal, and he was reading Billboard all the time, and he had this talking about, uh, uh, oh, this one's doing the concerts and this one's doing it, so he's very much reading this stuff, but he was keeping me awake at night. He says, Rodriguez, I got a job the next day, you can't be calling me all this late, you know, but he was still engaged in his mind and who would have thought down the road that he actually that came true he was doing all these things i opened up for him in london birmingham a couple years ago but you know when this mallet mallet came knocked on my door he said uh, he had a, a light girl with him from sweden said he was doing a documentary on rodriguez and would i help him so i did and uh and i even got baker's keyboard to open up on an off night so he could do some filming there and then he came uh, a year later and uh, did some additional stuff, and he did the same thing with Mike Theodore in New York. And who ever figured, we were just trying to help Rodriguez. 
you know, who would ever figure that Malick was such a genius that his point of view of that whole film made all the difference in the world in Rodriguez's career, other than South Africa and Australia. Do you know if he has any plans on recording again, or or is he just kind of riding the wave with uh, live dates? Or you know what we uh, Clarence Avon came up with some money ten years ago to record Rodriguez, and he just didn't have any songs to do it with, so uh, we couldn't do it. Now I understand. I think he has a, a a live album of something out. I don't know. We I don't really talk to him that much, so I don't know what he's doing. What are some of the other uh, known projects that you and Mike worked on through that time in the 70s? Well, you know what? We did CJ and Company. Devil's Gun was a huge disco R&B hit for us. And that was that was a big group. And then we had the gallery, and then we had myself. And uh, then for a while, you know, we were with Westbound. You know, we were doing, uh, Mike was doing the Detroit Emeralds, and I was doing the Fantastic Four, and uh, we were doing some groups that way, you know, that were out there. But I think... Uh, Probably in, in the early 70s, we were 11th in the country as record producers because of Scorpio and the gallery and stuff like that. How long did you guys work together? Uh, we worked together probably for about 25 years, and then Mike uh, and I uh, went to New York. We left L.A. after three years. I just wanted to come back. And then we went to New York for a couple of years, and because Mike was a sound engineer, he invested in a studio in New York. I didn't want to do that because I wasn't an engineer, and... Uh, uh, so, uh, after two years in the new, New York area, I came back and stayed in New York. And then oddly enough, uh, a couple of years ago, Mike came back here. <laughs> he moved back. He retired from, uh, he also had this, uh, big, uh, tropical fish tank business that he had, you know, putting him in uh, people's homes and so forth. So anyways, uh, he retired from that and he came back here because he wanted to do, uh, some music with me, and I had an album out in 2011, so I was, you know, still active. And and this uh, whole album that that we're talking about now is a project that me and Mike did. So he came all the way back here to do a project, and we got one. I know that you are still, as you said, you're still performing. Um, I assume you're still producing when the when things come up your last studio album as you mentioned was in 2011 any plans for any new studio work too uh yeah not not particularly you know uh right now i'm, I'm trying to uh, certainly uh figure out on the promotional aspect of, of this cd because it comes out friday and i've been doing a lot of interviews and so forth and uh it's going to hit the radio station so i'm going to do radio things after that and i might do some touring we'll just you know, minimally, not not a lot of touring like I did in 2011, but uh, maybe some. That's all I'm looking at, and just uh, you know, just playing. You know, uh, you never know what's going to happen. You sometimes you're a phone call away from some opportunity or some uh, job to do. So we'll see what happens. It's definitely a different landscape out there in the music world than than what it was in the past. So uh, I would think that in some ways there are more opportunities because it is a little bit easier to get things out into the marketplace digitally. But at the same time, there it's got to be a hard world out there. It is. It's very tough, especially, uh, you know, I've been at this place eight years, one night a week, and these young kids they do one-nighters most of the time, and they got to lug their gear, and most of the musicians here have day jobs. They can't make a living at music anymore. It's real tough, and they're they're all trying to get deals. Everybody's trying to get deals, and they're almost non-existent because the record business has changed so much. So I feel very fortunate that I have a deal, and it's a great album, and uh, here it is. So that, that to me, is a that's a big deal, you know? Well, I, I do wish you all the best with the new album. Uh, as I said, I, I really like it. I think it's a, it it's not only works really well within the context of today's music, but it's also a nice window into uh, where you were and what you were doing back in the late '60s. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I listen when I listened to that album, and I was like 28 years old when I did that, and that's probably why. Uh, at that point in time, uh, Clarence Baker, who owned Baker's Keyboard Lounge, calls me up one day and says, well, I want to introduce you to Groove Holmes. So Groove gets on the phone. He says, I want to take you on the road with me. I says, I can't go on the road with you. You know, I was a single parent, and I'm doing Motown and everything else. I says, uh, I really can't do that. 
So I couldn't go with him. And then when I was doing sessions in Atlantic, Jerry Wexler tried to hire me down there to be an Atlantic guy in uh, Miami. I says, well, I can't do that either. And not only that, the money's not enough. So <laughs> there you go. And And if that was today, you probably could have still done it because you could have uh, just sent in your uh, your your parts via the internet. Well, you know that's what we did with uh, the album in 2011. The, the different artists on the, on that album, uh, one was in California, one was in Europe. That's how the, we all did it. We did it through the internet. You know, I did the track here with Al Sutton, and uh, then we overdubbed. They overdubbed their parts on the internet and sent them back. Definitely a changing world. Thank you so much for talking with us. Well, I, I appreciate the interest uh, for you guys talking to me and being interested in me and my album. I always appreciate that, so thank you very much. Our thanks to Dennis Coffey for talking with us. His album, Hot Coffee and D, Burning at Maury Baker's Showplace Lounge, is available now. We'll be back soon with more editions of the VVN Music Podcast. Remember that you can hear the VVN Music Podcast via iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, and the VVN Music website. For the latest news on the veteran artists of rock, pop, soul, country, folk, and blues, go to vvnmusic.com. If you have any comments or questions about the website or this podcast, please send them to vvnnetwork at gmail.com. Our theme music is performed by Yahar. This program was recorded on January 11, 2017, and is a production of the VVN Network, copyright 2017.